Hi, and welcome to our Thursday session for week five of the three-piece seminar series, a collaboration brought to you by the Cure Parkinson's Trust, the World Parkinson's Coalition, and the Van Andel Institute. I'm Makala Johnson, a postdoc in Patrick Brunden's lab at the Van Andel Institute. And before I introduce our wonderful speakers for today, I just wanted to draw your attention to the bottom of the screen where there's a polling feature. Um, so next Thursday, the 7th of May, we've organised a career advice session where we have three panellists at varying stages of their career. Malu Tanzi, Laura volpicelli Daly, and Michael Henderson. So if you could answer these two questions regarding what you would like to be discussed in this session at any point during today's seminar, we'd greatly, greatly appreciate that. Okay, on to today's theme session of therapies for synuclonopathies. So our first speaker is Neil Chatterjee, a PhD student at Rush University. He's going to be presenting on engineering and optimizing the delivery of intracellular antibody-based therapies um, for synuclonopathies. So please use the Q&A feature to submit any questions for Neil throughout the presentation. And over to you, Neil. You just need to unmute now. Okay, thanks Mickey. Uh, and thanks to everyone who is hosting this seminar series. Uh, it's been a really welcome addition uh, to our quarantine schedule. So let me get my presentation pulled up. Hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Uh, so uh, I'm Neil Chatterjee. I'm a fourth year graduate student at Rush University in Jeff Cordover's lab in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about a therapeutic paradigm that we are focusing on for the target of alpha-synuclein and alpha-synuclein-based therapies. Um, so I'm going to start off uh, talking a little bit about how we are targeting alpha-synuclein uh, and what that means in the context of clinical therapy. You know, in this seminar series, we've actually spent a lot of time talking about alpha-synuclein and alpha-synuclein dynamics and aggregation and how that potentially plays a role in pathogenicity. Um, but there are still a lot of unanswered questions in terms of what our targets are and how that plays a role in clinical manifestations of disease. Uh, most commonly, we're aware of immunotherapies uh, that are based and kind of uh, built around the idea of rock staging for alpha-synuclein. So, uh, Typically, you have monomeric alpha-synuclein that aggregates, and then, uh, in theory, these alpha-synuclein proteopathic seeds can migrate from cell to cell and confer toxicity, and that migration or that propagation of uh, cell to cell seeding could potentially be associated with the progression of symptomatology that patients can experience uh, who are positive for a synucleinopathy. Uh, and so there's plenty of modalities, uh, mainly immunotherapies, passive and active immunotherapies that are in clinical trial currently. Um, oop, going a little ahead of myself. Uh, some of you may be aware of the recent announcement by Roche of their primary monoclonal antibody presinezumab uh, that did not uh, meet its primary endpoint, but uh, the press release said that there were signals of efficacy uh, so this is a familiar verse that we've heard when it comes to neurodegenerative diseases on a whole. So this leads to the question, what do we actually know and what don't we know about our targets for synucleinopathies and how can we get around and work around some of these issues and confounders? So when it comes to immunotherapies, one of the biggest questions is what proteoforms are we targeting in the first place? Uh, which alpha-synuclein proteoforms are existing in the extracellular space? What, are we targeting the right ones? And are the ones that we are targeting actually relevant to what happens in clinical manifestations of disease? Another question that comes to mind is how accessible are these targets? Uh, are the extracellular forms of alpha-synuclein exposed to intervention? Uh, are they protected by vesicles or tunneling nanotubes? Uh, how long, what is the latency of the existence of these proteoforms in the extracellular space and whether that's something that we can intervene with immunotherapy? So that leads us to kind of evaluating what's the best way of targeting what we do know about alpha-synuclein. Uh, what we do know is that Lewy pathology is an intracellular phenomenon. We know that LP is found intracells or interneuronally. Uh, we know that alpha-synuclein seeding 
uh, can be induced and aggregation can be induced intracellularly. And we know based on preclinical studies and some clinical evidence and data that the level of alpha-synuclein or the total alpha-synuclein load intracellularly can be a potential trigger for pathogenic seeding and toxicity uh, associated with these phenomena. So with that in mind, uh, our focus in the Cordover lab has been to focus on intracellular seeding and aggregation and potentially developing therapeutics that would target intracellular seeding of alpha-synuclein. And so uh, this project has really been um, the brainchild uh, with a fabulous collaboration that we have with Drs. Ann Messer and Dr. David Butler at the Neural Stem Cell Institute. And our weapon of choice for targeting uh, alpha-synuclein intracellularly is intrabodies. Uh, so I'm going to delve a little bit into the world of antibody engineering for those of you who may not be as familiar with some of these concepts. But here's your typical antibody. You have a full-length conventional aminoglobulin protein. And up here is the domain uh, that is actually responsible for epitope specificity and antigen binding. It's the antigen binding fragment. And if you're not actually concerned with the effector function of an antibody, we can just go ahead and engineer and lop off these antibody uh, antigen binding fragments and have single chain variable fragments that are small variable domains of both the heavy and light chain for human antibodies. And even more so, we can further engineer this and divide off single domain nanobodies uh, that feature just the heavy chain variable component of that nanobody. And what we have is a very small 14 to 16 kilodalton protein that maintains epitope specificity and binding affinity and is easily engineerable and can be expressed intracellularly. And some of those engineering concepts might be to enhance the infinity of the construct, to enhance its overall function or add functionality to it, to uh, stabilize the molecule or stabilize the protein. Uh, so with regards to our project, one of the engineering concepts is adding a pest fusion to our intrabody concepts. Pest fusions are polypeptide motifs that are rich in proline, aspartate, glutamate, serines, and threonines, hence pest. Uh, they were originally found in murine ornithine decarboxylase proteins, ODCs, are uh, proteins that are associated with polyamine synthesis. Uh, and biologists noticed that ODCs had really short half-lives. Uh, and what was determined was that the C-terminal pest motifs that were tethered to the ODCs were actually ubiquitin independent pathways for shuttling ODC proteins to the proteasome, binding to the 19S uh, regulatory lid. Uh, and clearing out or uh, enhancing the degradation of those particles through the proteasome. And so when you take a pest degron and fuse it to another protein, uh, you can essentially hijack that proteasomal shuttling mechanism for the protein of target, in which our case is our nanobody or antibody products. Importantly, uh, adding pest fusions to nanobodies or proteins uh, is an easy way to actually enhance the overall solubility of constructs. And so here are a number of different potential nanobodies or single chain variable fragments. And upon the fusion of these pest motifs, which are highly negatively charged, you drop the overall isoelectric point of proteins. You can significantly drop the net charge of these proteins and decrease the overall gravy score or the grand average of hydropathy. Uh, so in essence, you're making your overall contracts, constructs much more soluble uh, and able to be stably expressed in solution. So what makes these intrabodies? Uh, so our weapon of choice for getting these nanobody products or constructs inside the cell is gene therapy. We're taking viral vectors that express the DNA for our nanobody constructs and then having the cell's own machinery turn these genes into transcripts and then translate into functional protein. And then that functional protein therapeutic can target whatever its antigen of choice is. In our case, the NAC region of alpha-synuclein, so the region that's so critical for uh, proteopathic seeding and binding. And now we have a bi bifunctional construct that has two main mechanisms of action. First, you have a mechanism of action by directly interfering with that NAC domain and preventing the seeding and aggregation of alpha-synuclein to more mature ag aggregate fibrillar structures. And the second is to be able to reduce potentially the level of monomeric substrate that's available in a system uh, by taking that cargo and shuttling it to the proteasome for clearance. And so after evaluating a number of strong affinity binders that were derived from both uh, yeast display libraries and phage display libraries. 
we selected a number of different constructs uh, that were successful in vitro in effectively clearing out alpha synuclein levels when code transfected into neuronal cell lines. Uh, and we wanted to take that proof of principle further into an in vivo study. And so this data was published a few years ago. Uh, and these are Sprague Dolly rats that were unilaterally injected with AAV overexpressing alpha synuclein into the substantia nigra. And in these animals, we see what we typically see. Uh, this is uh, phosphorylated S129 staining, so a pathological marker for alpha synuclein aggregation. Uh, and in the animals that were just injected with the AAV overexpressor of alpha synuclein, we see this very strong prominent staining. Uh, but in the animals that were injected with AAVs carrying our intrabody constructs, we saw a significant decrease in the overall level of pathology that we saw in the substantia, substantia nigra. And so this was extremely promising and showed that not only could these nanobodies be expressed intracellularly, but they were showing some evidence of engaging the target alpha synuclein that we were seeing in these systems. Uh, the original constructs that we used uh, were hybrid constructs that had a murine uh, pest degron associated with them. So the next stage of clinical development for us was to fully humanize the construct uh, and be able to test its efficacy in uh, further developed models that we were developing in our labs. Uh, so what we had seen from our previous in vitro work and our in vivo work was that VH14, uh, which is our primary lead therapeutic at this stage, is capable of proper assembly, target engagement, and pathological reduction, both in vitro and in vivo. Uh, and fortunately, VH14 was actually derived, it's an unprotected human binder, so it's already of human origin. The pest region that we had originally fused to the VH14 construct was both was a murine derived construct. So because of that humanization uh, that is necessary for the progression of clinical trial, uh, for something to reach clinical trial eventually, uh, this is where most of the engineering had to go for the next step, set of experiments. So kind of running parallel to those next set of experiments are a couple key questions. First, uh, are we able to have VH14 or see VH14 pests actively engage alpha synuclein in human cells? We had yet to try this in a human cell population. And how can we best provide sustained intrabody expression throughout the neuraxis? Uh, that second question is important from the standpoint of we're really trying to approach this from the tools that we currently have to explain synucleinopathies as we currently know them. Uh, when PD patients or people with Parkinson's show up to the clinic, it's after the induction of symptomatology. And until we have a better characterization of the prodrome of synucleinopathies or have biomarkers that can better predict conversion to a synucleinopathy, our primary concern is to slow down the progression of synucleinopathy. And one aspect of that is being able to transduce cells with viral vectors carrying intrabodies, potential recipient cells that might be selectively vulnerable for synucleinopathy and see if we can limit the level of substrate or interfere with aggregation so that those cell populations are protected potentially from a synucleinopathic insult. And so uh, with the progression of this, uh, now I'm gonna start showing some unpublished data. Uh, our first uh, kind of screen check was to uh, evaluate whether a fully humanized construct with a human pest that shares about 77% homology with that of the murine pest uh, was just as efficient in clearing out levels of alpha synuclein. So these are co-transfected plasmids of VH14 tethered to the murine pest as well as the human pest, uh, co-transfected with alpha synuclein in rat striatal uh, neuronal cells. Uh, and what we see from our overall alpha synuclein expression levels is that we see almost nearly equivalent levels of reduction from both constructs, meaning that the human pest derived construct, uh, as confirmed by immunoblot as well, is just as efficient in targeting alpha synuclein and engaging with alpha synuclein as our previous murine construct. So now our first question leads to the human cell profile that we're trying to actively test target engagement in. And our weapon of choice for these investigations uh, are cerebral organoids. So why use organoids? Why use a 3D culture system instead of our traditional 2D culture? Uh, and one of the re main reasons is brain complexity. When we use 2D culture systems, we're isolating individual cells or maybe co-culturing. But I like to think of it from the standpoint of trying to figure out what interactions actually occur within a human brain. You have your typical neuronal cells and your support glia, but on top of that, you have 
uh, motility cells, you have vasculature that's associated with it, you have precursor cells, you have immune cells, and all of these cells are all functionally, functionally working together in a network to adapt to a really complex organ tissue. And so part of the lack of translatability between in vitro studies and in vivo studies, or even more so clinical studies, is not having that integrity to the complexity of the system that we're evaluating. And so cerebral organoids are ways to culture in 3D, have that contact interaction between multiple different diverse cell types. These organoids self-organize and differentiate accordingly based on the protocols that we put them through. And they're long-term culture systems. You're not constantly passaging them. Uh, they are long-term embryoid structures that can exist in culture uh, well past a year. And you can have experiments that last uh, without cells constantly going through replication cycles. And so uh, I got to give a quick shout out to the Parkinson's Foundation um, for awarding me a grant uh, in which I had the tremendous fortune to go travel to the Neural Stem Cell Institute and learn these techniques and conduct these experiments. Uh, and so our approach to uh, this screening platform was to take iPSC organoids that were derived from PD patients. So we took patients who had triplications of the alpha synuclein locus, uh, which generates excess alpha syn and leads to Parkinsonism. And taking iPSCs from these patients uh, you can culture them, uh, form 3D embryoid bodies, and then you can push or differentiate uh, these embryoid bodies to different regions of the brain, depending on which patterning mediums that you switch embryoids into for multiple days in vitro. And for the first initial screen, we wanted to start with four brain organoids. Four brain organoids tend to be a, a little bit easier to deal with, especially when you're dealing with iPSCs. Uh, that come from mute patients that have mutations or patients that have modifications to the genetic back structure. Uh, and our quality control checks for four brain organoids after 20 days in vitro are to check whether they are actually expressing four brain organoid uh, differentiation markers. So these organoids at 20 days are SOX2, PAX6, and FOXG1 positive, which are all positive markers for four brain organoids. A negative selection marker is SOX10. We see that the SNCA triplication organoids have a much higher expression level for uh, human alpha synuclein, so that means that they are viable targets for our intrabody treatment. And when we infect with lentivirus carrying our intrabody treatments, we see sustained expression of our intrabodies within these really beautiful networked organoids that cluster and differentiate accordingly. And if you look closely at the cells that are actually infected with our nanobody constructs intracellularly, we see a significant reduction in the cells that are treated with the humanized uh, version of the VH14H pest when compared to both the control organoids or control or, or, or organoids that were, control, uh, were treated with VH14 with a scrambled pest variant or an inactivated pest, so no proteasomal localization of alpha-synuclein, meaning that we are actively targeting uh, and engaging in human cell populations. And so with this, we are now currently investigating midbrain organoids. Obviously, we're talking about this within the, with the context of uh, a PD population. Uh, so we have generated midbrain organoids that stain positively for FOXA2, TH. Um, this is single cell RNA-seq data that shows a population of cells that are positive for NER1 and GERC2. So not only are we generating dopaminergic TH positive neurons, but specifically we are generating neurons that have an A9 specific uh, subtype, uh, which is much more relevant and pertinent to the nigrostriatal degeneration that is observed in Parkinson's patients. Uh, and as we speak, we currently have long-term intrabody treatment experiments going on midbrain organoids, and hopefully we'll have exciting data to pull from those experiments. Uh, and to wrap up really quickly, the last bit uh, question that we're trying to address right now is, um, how do we most uh, definitely expand our ability to hit this therapeutic intervention in multiple different cell types and protect some cell types uh, from a impending synucleinopathic attack, uh, whether that's thing, cell types that might be relevant to uh, cognitive deficits or behavioral deficits that might come down the line of a uh, progressive version of PD or synucleinopathy. And one of the ways is to explore engineered vi viral variants uh, that are derived from AV9. AV9s are the viral capsids that are uh, the gold standard for biodistribution in terms of CNS targeting. 
Uh, and when you engineer capsids, as has been the case in the past few years, and doing some uh, positive uh, exploration with how these viral ve vectors can enhance viral transduction into the CNS, uh, in our hands, we've seen that when we cisternally, or basically the rodent equivalent of an intrathecal injection, when we cisternally deliver these viral variants of AAV9 to the cisterna magna, uh, we see much more enhanced viral transduction in cell types throughout cortical layers and subcortical layers into the substantia nigra and the cerebellum. And we're currently employing these methods of viral transduction uh, to be able to, in parallel with our organoid study, uh, test whether we're able to transduce a cell population in vivo that might protect other pockets of cell subpopulations or neuronal subpopulations that we eventually do see progressive pathology reaching as our in vivo models are allowed to develop over the course of time. And with that, uh, I'll wrap up by uh, sending a quick thank you to our collaborators uh, at the Neural Stem Cell Institute and in David. Uh, at the University of Cambridge, the late Chris Stopson, many of you uh, are aware. Um, Erwin, everyone at the Cordover Lab, uh, we love collaborating, we love uh, team science, and in case anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me uh, directly at this contact. Here's my Twitter handle. Uh, thanks to all our funding agencies, and a final thank you, not, last but not least, to uh, everyone who helps put on this seminar series. It's been a really fantastic uh, thing for us to tune into every single week, and I appreciate uh, having the opportunity to speak to you all today. Fantastic presentation, Neil. Um, so to start off with the Q&A portion, a uh, question on what drives the reduction of pathology more? Do you think it's the interference of aggregation or the reduction of alpha synuclein? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and at this point in time, we actually don't know. Uh, one of the things that we're investigating in our current in vivo cohorts is if we inject uh, VH14 H pest constructs with the scrambled pest or the inactivated pest and see whether we have a alleviated pathology in those cohorts and what degree of that alleviated pathology is compared to the VH14 constructs that have a functional pest domain uh, to look at the differential relief of pathology and kind of compare from that standpoint. So um, we're also doing that in our midbrain organoid cultures to see whether we can, whether just having the interference of aggregation is sufficient enough to be able to slow down or halt the progression of pathology in our mind. So just kind of a follow up on that is, do you think that these nanobodies are clearing the already existing Lewy body pathology or do you think that they can just prevent further accumulation? Yeah, so, you know, at the, at the time of Lewy pathology, at least in the case of uh, clinical PD or even in our models, depending on the temporality of when we decide to intervene, Lewy pathology is a crazy mess of fibrillar aggregates along with a lot of uh, membranous uh, organelles that are, are either uh, dysfunctional or have been degraded to some extent. So uh, what is really a difficult thing to foresee is being able to reverse Lewy pathology. In the current context, I think what makes the most sense is being able to potentially prevent uh, the establishment of Lewy pathology. And from a clinical standpoint, as certain investigations of um, biomarkers or a further characterization of the synucleonopathic prodrome uh, come to light, this may be ways to potentially protect vulnerable subpopulations of uh, neurons and be able to treat them with uh, nanobodies or intrabodies ahead of time. Okay, interesting. A uh, question here from Cara about, have you confirmed that the reduction in the synuclein levels that you're seeing are not just due to loss of neurons that had the aggregates and this toxicity? Um, yeah. But <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah that's a great question. Loss? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, in our first foray into our in vivo uh, investigations, we actually uh, did not see enough neuronal loss just from the model induction alone to see the level of degeneration where, in which we would see 
cellular rescue. What we did see was that uh, the synuclein AAV overexpression that we saw that we had used, um, had, we started seeing some early signs of striatal degeneration uh, and that was rescued by our VH14 con construct as well. Uh, in our current models that we're employing, we're expanding the time course a little bit more so that we are definitively going to see that level of nigrostriatal degeneration. And then hopefully we'll be able to see uh, a preservation or in theory, uh, observe a preservation of those neurons uh, as opposed to the control treated neurons that would experience that level of degeneration. Interesting, it'll be interesting to see how those studies pan out. A uh, question here from Maria. What if you're overwhelming the proteasome or if the proteasome is not as functional due to the aging of cells? Can you comment on that? Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of data out there, obviously, about UPS uh, dysfunction in PD patients or in PD models as well. Uh, one of the most interesting parts of using the PEST motif is that it's ubiquitin independent. Uh, and these motifs occur naturally throughout biology. Again, the proteasome is constantly being employed throughout the course of a cell's lifetime, whether that's for aggregating proteins, dysfunctional proteins, proteins that have just led to the end of their time course within a uh, cell population. So um, we haven't seen any evidence of dysfunction or inflammation that's a result of overactivity of the proteasome. These aren't activating the proteasome, it just happens to be shuttling to existing proteasomes that are already employed and assembled within the cell space. Uh, but that's something that we're definitely monitoring both in our organoid cultures uh, to see whether we're getting too much localization of the proteasome or enhanced clearance. Mm -hmm. uh, another question from the audience here. Uh, from Poonam, uh, is it enough to target only alpha synuclein? Are other components of the Lewy bodies or aggregates also affected by these nanobodies, or could they be? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, and, you know, this is always a sticky point when we're targeting something like alpha synuclein, when we're still actively learning so much about alpha synuclein's role into pathogenesis. But uh, the way I like to approach it too is we're actually generating a toolkit at the same time. Uh, of being able to further delineate some of the mechanistic contributions of alpha synuclein to pathogenesis in our model systems. Uh, so whether or not just alleviating alpha synuclein pathology is going to be enough to disrupt the progression of pathogenesis in these models is a question that we'd like to investigate further. We're also interested in knowing how alleviating alpha synuclein burden might play a role into systems in which we have concomitant pathologies that might also feature tauopathies or any other misfolded protein that might be exacerbated given the proteostatic stresses of the system that we're exploring. Interesting. Uh, so continuing on about alpha synuclein, uh, Kurt is wondering whether you expect lowering the alpha synuclein cause, could cause any unwanted side effects due to loss of alpha synuclein's negative function. Yeah, that's a big question. Uh, obviously, alpha synuclein has uh, an important role in neuronal function. Uh, some of that is a little up in the air in terms of what we know about it at this point in time. Um, in our initial in vivo investigations, uh, we saw a reduction in pathology in those nigral neurons. But when we looked at overall levels of alpha synuclein, we did not see statistically significant decreases of overall alpha synuclein expression in the substantia nigra. So one way to potentially interpret those results is that you are lowering the level of alpha synuclein to a level that is no longer permissive for aggregation or templating. Uh, but that's something that we need to investigate a little bit further in our current models. One thing that we are looking into uh, is potentially engineering pest efficiency to proteasomal localization. So seeing whether we can generate a series of constructs that with varying degrees of efficiency will either shuttle alpha synuclein to the proteasome with 100% efficiency, for example, by enhancing proteasomal uh, clearance, or by shutting off proteasomal clearance and seeing how um, that might play a role into protecting or rescuing uh, the cells within the system. Now for a more methodology-based question from Teresa. Regarding the viral vector delivery, when did you inject the vectors and how did you deliver it? Uh, yeah, so in the organoids, uh, obviously the viral vectors that were injected were um, a month after differentiation. Uh, for the in vivo cohorts, for the initial in vivo cohorts, 
uh, they were also one month after induction of synucleinopathy. So these were all aged adult animals. In the current in vivo cohorts, we actually have even older animals. We want this to most adequately reflect an aging uh, PWP population. Uh, so uh, we have aged animals that we have induced our seeding model in, uh, and then promptly a month and a half after the induction of pathology, we treat these animals uh, either with cisternal injections of uh, our intrabody therapies or direct intranigral injections of those therapies. Maybe just one final question here from Naveen. What fraction of the midbrain organoids are TH positive neurons and is there any preference for the AAV to a specific cell type? Yeah, so uh, based on the single cell RNA-seq data that we had from our wild type midbrain organoids, we're seeing about a 13 to 20% level of expression of uh, midbrain TH positive neurons. Uh, so obviously we have a vast number of other cell populations. Now these organoids can get to be pretty big, so we get a substantial number of cells uh, at the level that we are actually sacrificing these organoids and doing those different uh, those characterizations on. Uh, but yeah, roughly around 13 to 20 percent is what we see on a consistent basis. Okay, thanks again. Excellent presentation thanks. and great job with the Q&A. We'll now introduce the second speaker for today's session is Lisa Berkliff, a postdoc at the Van Andel Institute and usually my fellow chair for these 3P series. But today Lisa is presenting on inhibiting the mitochondrial pyruvate carrier does not ameliorate synuclinopathy in the absence of inflammation or metabolic deficits. So over to you, Lisa. Thank you so much, Mickey. And thank you, Neil. That was such a great talk. Uh, let's put this in full screen. So, yes, so like Mickey said, my name is Lisa Berkvist. I'm a postdoc uh, in Patrick Brundin's lab at the Van Andel Institute. And I'm going to talk about some data we have on uh, using an insulin sensitizer in two alpha synuclein based rodent models of Parkinson's disease. So, I some of you or most of you maybe know that there are some indications that Parkinson's disease and type 2 diabetes are linked or have some commonalities. So type 2 diabetes is a complex metabolic disease and it's characterized by chronic insulin resistance and it's, there's also a progressive loss of beta cell function. And what's interesting is that in PD patients, diabetes is established in 8 to 30 percent of all PD patients, and this is constantly in excess uh, of the prevalence we see in non-PD individuals. So a meta-analysis that included almost 1.8 million individuals uh, showed that diabetes is associated with a 38 percent increased risk of developing PD. So there definitely seems to be some commonalities and some links between the diseases. Uh, on a cellular or molecular level, we see insulin resistance in both diseases. We see that in the brain of non-diabetic PD patients. We have mitochondrial function and protein aggregation in both diseases, and also inflammation is present. So a study that Atuda and his colleagues published in 2017 uh, showed uh, the results from a randomized double-blind a placebo controlled trial where they used a GLP-1 analog exenatide, which is an anti-diabetic drug developed for the use of type 2 diabetes originally. And this drug was able in this um, clinical trial to reduce the deterioration in uh, PD patients' motor symptoms. And what was interesting here was that, also interesting here, was that uh, they were treated for 48 weeks. And after 48 weeks, there was a washout period of 12 weeks where the patients didn't receive any treatment. And then they were reevaluated again, and they saw that uh, positive effects were sustained after this washout period. And there's currently a phase three trial of Xenity ongoing right now, and I think it's supposed to wrap up in 2023. So it will be very interesting to see the results from this. Uh, but the drug I'm going to talk about today is not the GLP-1 analog. It belongs to a group of drugs called TCDs, and they work through improving, they improve uh, insulin sensitivity through PPR gamma, uh, which is a nuclear transcription factor activation, and they also interact with the mitochondrial pyruvate carrier, or the MPC. And there have been population-based studies that have shown that if you have uh, diabetes and you're taking TCDs, then you have, you lower your risk of developing Parkinson's disease. 
So this was tested in a PD phase two clinical trial where the TCD piled with the zone was, tested, was used. And as you can see here in the conclusions, they say that pioglitazone is, uh, as it is dosed here, is uh, unlikely to modify the progression of early Parkinson's disease. Uh, so I mentioned that TCDs affect PPR gamma and MPC. And there are a lot of side effects from TCT activation of PPR gamma, which include weight gain and fluid retention, but also some more severe uh, side effects uh, can be seen like congestive heart failure and bladder cancer. So this uh, affects how highly you can dose this drug and also potentially have any beneficial effects from using higher doses of the drug. And also, it seems that the interaction with the mitochondrial pyruvate carrier, the MPC, seem to be responsible for their neuroprotective effects. So the drug I've been studying is a new generation, generation TCD called MSDC0160. And this is a new generation TCD that does not interact with PPR gamma. So the main target of MSDC is the MPC, the mitochondrial pyruvate carrier. And because of this, uh, we can give a higher dose of this drug. And uh, so the clinical dose for MSDC, as you see here on the left, is significantly higher than with the clinical top dose of pioglitazone. And also the interaction of MSDC is much more uh, potent uh, with the mitochondria. So as you can see here, when you dose MSDC and pioglitazone, uh, Similarly, uh, the same dose, you see that we have a lot more of the active metabolite reaching the mitochondria uh, from MSDC compared to pioglitazone. So this uh, tells us that this could potentially exert beneficial effects in Parkinson's disease. So in a paper from our group that was published in 2016, they tested MSDC in several PD models. One of the models was a genetic PD mouse model, uh, the engrailed model, where they saw that the drug was able to um, show positive beneficial effect on motor behavior test using open field testing. They looked at dopaminergic cell survival and saw that it was increased when the mice were treated with uh, uh, the drug. And also they saw that straight dopamine and dopac levels were uh, sustained uh, when treated with the drug. And they also tested this in a C. elegans Hi. worm model. Yeah. Well, I where they... <laughs> Hi, Neil. <laughs> Where they, uh, they overexpressed the, the mutant A53T alpha synuclein variant in dopaminergic neurons and saw that when they treated the worms with MSDC, they had a reduction in dopaminergic cell loss. And when they looked into what was actually going on, what was causing, uh, what was the, the cause of these beneficial effects, they saw that MSDC was able to attenuate inflammation and also restore autophagy. And this is more uh, in detail described the hypothesis of the neuroprotective effects from MSDC in this um, review from Walter and Emmanuel in our lab, if anybody's interested in reading that. Uh, but what, they did, what we haven't looked at is the effects of MSDC in a chronic progressive alpha-synuclein-based models. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today and it's data from uh, myself and Walter Pilarts, our colleague in the group. He's been using a RAT AAV model over expressing human alpha-synuclein and treating these mice with MSDC. And I've been using a seeding model where we inject preform alpha-synuclein fibrils into the olfactory bulb. And I've been looking at MSDC effect on alpha-synuclein spread of propagation. Uh, so I'm gonna start with Walter's uh, um, AAV model results. So as I said, we used the AAV overexpression model with, where we had unilateral nigral injections of two different viral vector titers, which are gonna go call alpha synuclein high and ACIN low throughout the rest of the, this presentation. And we were uh, treating these mice with MSDC containing chow or placebo for four months after injections. And first, uh, Walter did a cylinder test to look at any motor phenotypes and so there's a lot of groups here. You see the naive, which is mice that didn't uh, receive any injection. We have GFP construct, and then the ACE in low and the ACE in high groups. And throughout the presentation, the placebo groups are gonna be white and the gray one is corresponding to the animals that received MSDC treatment. So as you can see here, first of, uh, neither the ACE in low or the ACE in high have a significant effect on motor behavior, though there is some trend maybe for the ACE in high group, but there's no significant difference. And the drug doesn't have any significant difference either. 
Next, Walter did stereological counts of Th possible cell, Th positive cells in the nigra, and a lot of bars here, but I think you can appreciate that they're pretty much the same and there's no significant difference. So there's no dopaminergic cell loss due to uh, the viral vector expression of alpha synuclein, and we don't see any effects from uh, the MSDC treatment either. Though if you look at the TH staining, it does appear to be lower, uh, just by eye, uh, in the alpha synuclein high group. So what Walter did then was that he stained with uh, eustrelation staining against TH, and quantified the positive TH staining in the anterior part of the nigra and the posterior part of the nigra. And what popped up then is that we do see that there's a significant decrease in TH positive staining in the ACIN high group that's been treated with uh, MSDC. And this is compared to the control groups. There's no difference between the ACIN high seaboard ACIN high MSDC group. And in the posterior nigra, there's no effect at all. Then we we'll moved on to looking at the effect of MSDC on alpha synuclein pathology, and we use phosphorylated P serine 129 alpha synuclein as a readout for pathological alpha synuclein here. Uh, and it did a stereological count of phosphoserine positive cells in the Nigra and did see that MSDC treatment in the ACIN low group resulted in a significant increase in. Uh, phosphoserine positive cells in the nigra, and there's no difference between treatment groups for uh, the ACIN high group. And biochemical analysis to accompany this show that uh, MSDC treatment increased both soluble and insoluble phosphoserine levels in the ACIN high group here instead. We do see the same trend in the ACIN low group, but there's not a significant effect there. We also wanted to see if uh, uh, modulating the mitochondrial pirouette carrier with uh, MSDC would affect ox uh, oxidation state of alpha synuclein, and nitrated alpha synuclein is a marker for oxidated alpha synuclein. So, uh, PLA, proximity ligation assay between TOM20, which is the marker for the outer mitochondrial membrane, it's a protein there, and nitrated synuclein was carried out and we see that it lights up nicely in the injected side uh, but we see nothing in the uninjected side. So we have nitrated alpha synuclein in the mitochondrial outer membrane and serological counts of this showed again that in the ACIN low level we do get a significant increase in these nitrated alpha synuclein uh, positive cells in the nigra when treating with MSDC. So as I mentioned earlier uh, we've seen that MSDC is able to have positive, positive beneficial effects in other uh, P models, and that this is because it's able to attenuate inflammation and restore autophagy. So what about any of these events in the AAV overexpression model? So again, there's a lot of bars here, but as I think you can appreciate without going into too much detail, is that most of them look exactly the same. We don't really see any uh, changes in GFAP, IBA1, uh, catepsin D, or LAMP1 uh, levels in the AAV model. So there doesn't seem to be any uh, inflammation or autophagy happening, deficits happening in the AAV model. That was the first model. The next one we used was the PFF seeding model. So here we had a unilateral OB and olfactory bulb injections of alpha synuclein PFFs. And again, we treated this with chow containing MSCDC or placebo. And for this project, uh, we had two different time points. We stacked mice one and three months after PFF injections. So I did a buried pellet test where I evaluated olfactory dysfunction. And the first thing to say is that we don't see any effect from injecting in olfactory behavioral using this test uh, between PBS and the PFF group. So the PBS is the control group. And again, no, 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 um, no effect from MSDC treatment. I also counted the new N positive uh, cells in the AON three months after PFF injections and see, again, there's no difference in neuronal cell survival from uh, induced by PFF injection and there's no effect from MSDC treatment either. I then evaluated alpha synuclein pathology load and spread in two different brain regions of these mice, both one and three months after PFF injection. So I started by looking in the anterior olfactory nucleus and then also looked in the perirhinal cortex. 
And what I can see is that I have more pathology in the AON compared to the PRH, which is what we expect since the AON is close, most closely connected to the uh, site of injection of the PFFs. And we see that we have more uh, pathology on the ipsilateral side compared to the contralateral side. And that the pathology increases in the perirhinal cortex from the one to the three month time point, And it increases also on the contralateral side uh, from the one to the three month time point. So all of this is in line with that. Uh, we have propagation happening in this model. But MSDZ has no effect on pathology load or spread of alpha synuclein. As we had seen some nitrated synuclein in the AAV seeding model, we of course stained for that as well in the PFF model and didn't find anything in either of the treatment groups. And looking at microglia morphology as an indicator of potential inflammation happening, we look at the area to perimeter ratio for microglia. So when they're resting, you have a lower area to ratio per perimeter because you have a smaller body and these longer protrusions. And as they become activated, this uh, area to ratio perimeter increases. But as you can appreciate, there's really no difference, well, there is no difference between any of the treatment groups. And PFF's injections doesn't seem to affect this. And I looked at LAMP2 signal in the AON, so all of this is three months after injection, and we see no differences there either. So to summarize the effects that we see on, in these two different models, um, we have no effect on neuronal cell survival from MSDC treatment. And with that being said, we don't see any decrease in neuronal cell survival due to the AAV uh, overexpression of alpha synuclein or to the, due to the PFF injections. We see that in the AAV model, we have increased uh, phosphorylated alpha synuclein and nitrated alpha synuclein, and that we see that this nitrated alpha synuclein is present in the ultra mitochondrial membrane. While in the PFF model, we see no effect on phosphosterin load or spread, or we don't, we don't see any uh, nitrated alpha synuclein at all. So I wanted to kind of try and tease out more of the differences that we're seeing in this model in the, concerning alpha synuclein. So just before, uh, the lockdown here in Michigan, I was doing a test stain using an amyloid binding probe. So this HFDAA binds to beta sheet rich amyloid structures and become fluorescent. And I only detected these HFDAA positive amyloid structures in the PFF CD model and not in the AAV over expression model. So there's definitely something that differs between these two models so when it comes to the conformational state or the aggregation state of alpha synuclein. So that, that brings me to my summary and conclusion slide. So as I said, we do see nitrated synuclein only in the AAV overexpression model, and potentially it seems like we only see HFDAA positive structures in the PFF seeding model. I need to repeat that as soon as I'm able to go back into the lab to confirm. Uh, in regards to MSDC, we don't see it having an ameliorating effect on alpha synuclein aggregation or propagation when we don't have any inflammation or autophagy deficits ever happening. Uh, but however, I do think that the clinical value of the drug could still be important because as of now yet, it's still not known how clinically useful inhibiting alpha synuclein aggregation will be. And also MSDC has almost no or very minor side effects. And maybe the most important point to thing to bring up here is that these rodent models uh, have no dysfunction in any of the pathways that have been indicated in the drug's mechanism of action. So with that, I would like to thank you for listening and also the lab, of course, Walter Pilar for his job, all his work in, with the AAV model and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Great presentation. Um, so to start off the Q&A session, we have a question here from Kurt. How did you select the dose of MSDC and how do you know whether it reaches the substantial Niagara? So the dosage of MSDC is based on that we know that if we have uh, it in the chow and the animals have uh, continuous um, access to it, they will continue to eat enough that it follows their body weight to have a, the appropriate dosage. And we haven't looked at uh, any of the drug metabolite levels in the brain of these animals. We have looked at plasma levels and seen that there's a significant amount of the metabolite present in the plasma. And do you think in those previous studies that have shown a positive effect in MSDC that 
those results could have had an effect because of the peripheral effects like on the immune system rather than access to the brain. I think that's very, very interesting. And I think my opinion is we don't really know for any of these drugs that affect peripherals, the peripheral system as well. It could be that this is an outwards in kind of effect where you have a positive effect in the periphery that then uh, reflects uh, in the brain as well. But yeah, so I don't really see, I think that's a, a very much a possibility. Uh -huh. Question here from Emily. How do you think MSDC attenuates inflammation and restores the autophagy? So we, uh, in this uh, paper that I mentioned in the review, it's very nicely described how we hypothesize that this is taking place. But what MSDC does is that it modulates the MPC, the mitochondrial pyruvate carrier. So it prevents, modulates the mitochondria's uptake of pyruvate. And in this said, uh, the mitochondria needs to rewire and use other substrates for fueling its carbon metabolism. So you can use glutamate or uh, alanine or aspartase, and this will have downstream effects. And we, I don't, it's not really known how, which um, uh, system that this goes through. We know that it prevents uh, mTOR activation and that could in itself uh, restore autophagy. And we also know that it has direct effects on microglia. So if you culture uh, BB2 cells and add the drug, uh, we do see that it directly affects microglia, but could also be a neuron to microglia effect in vivo. Perhaps you can post the link or upload yeah. the PDF of the paper, review paper, to the 3P discussion Facebook page. Definitely. Uh, a question here on why do you see uh, why do you not see the same effect for the MSDC in both the alpha serotonin high and the alpha serotonin low groups in terms of the AAV model? So yeah, so that's an uh, interesting question. Uh, so we have we see in the AA uh, the ACN low level, uh, low model when we look at counting uh, phosphoserine positive uh, cells or nitrated cells, we do see uh, an increase from MSDC, but we don't see that from uh, in the ACN high group. And this could be just a saturating effect that we there is. There could be the same effect happening. We do see with the biochemical data that there's a significant increase in insoluble phosphoserine, but we don't see that using immunohistochemistry. It could just be a methodological <laughs> issue in why we can't see that there. There's just so much alpha synuclein that with IHC, it just you can't really see any differences. A mm -hmm. uh, question here from Malu. What do you make of the differences between the AAV synuclein and the AA? in PFF models, which do you think is more informative to model for PD pathogenesis and progression? Well, so I think it's actually very interesting that we do see differences between the two models. And I think in a sense, this, this project have been very enlightening in how big the differences actually are between different alpha synuclein based models, which people don't really, I feel like that hasn't really been highlighted. So I think that's a very nice outcome of this study. Uh, in the AAV model, we're overexpressing soluble uh, alpha synuclein to a very located area. And apparently this seems to be, when you have an overexpression of alpha synuclein, soluble alpha synuclein in the nigra here, that's enough for it to start interact with the mitochondrial membrane, become nitrated, and we see this nitrated synuclein, and which could also um, uh, speed on the aggregation or uh, make that happen. And in the PFF model, we're only adding PFFs that then make the endogenous uh, alpha synuclein aggregate. So I think it's um, very interesting. I don't really know. I've, when it comes to which one is more relevant, my dream project to move on from this would be using the engrailed model where we know we have uh, inflammation and autophagy deficits and also inject PFFs uh, somewhere in the, in the OB to see the spread and see if having a model where we actually have more of a lifelike physiologically relevant environment, if that will have, uh, what effect that will have of alpha, on alpha synuclein spread and propagation. I think that would be the most uh, valid the model in this case to evaluate the drug. Yeah, that'd be an interesting project. Uh, so 
following on from what you were just talking in the answer there, why do you think you see nitrated sinuclein in the AB model, but not in the PFF seeding model? It's kind of what I just uh, mentioned that we're having, we're having this overexpression of uh, soluble alpha synuclein in a very located area. And maybe we have these lipids in the mitochondrial membrane where the alpha synuclein can interact and uh, become nitrate oxidated. And we see this, this accumulation of nitrate alpha synuclein in the AAV model, while we, in the PFF model, we don't have this uh, increase of soluble uh, alpha synuclein at all. Question from Brianna. Is there any evidence that MSDC might be effective for other aggregated proteins such as tau? So to my knowledge, it hasn't been tested uh, with tau specifically, though uh, it has been, uh, MSDC has been tested in a clinical phase two trial with uh, Alzheimer's disease patients. And this was mainly to see if it would, uh, the main goal of that study was to see if it would be able to uh, alter glucose metabolism. So they were given MSDC or control for uh, 12 weeks and they did uh, PET scans to uh, look at glucose metabolism. And what they did see was that in the whole brain and the pons, uh, MSDC treatment didn't have an effect, but in, I don't remember really what brain regions there are, the cerebellum, I think, uh, they did see that uh, MSDC was able to maintain glucose metabolism while the controls were declining during that 12 week period. So I think definitely that any disease where we have inflammation and autophagy, uh, this drug could be beneficial. A uh, question from Poonam. What do you think uh, about the models where a combination of AAV and fibrils have been used? Uh, I think it's interesting. I don't know how, if it's more relevant. Uh, like I said, I think um, the what, what would be interesting moving forward would use a model where we can have, I'm not specifically, I don't know specifically, do we maybe see inflammation and autophagy deficits in these models in this that case? I think it's more interesting, but I think what needs to be done is put together the alpha synuclein spread together with uh, these other uh, cellular issues as well. And one final question here from Lindsay. Has MSCC been in any clinical trials for PD or for diabetes? So it hasn't been in a clinical trial for, trial for PD. Like I mentioned, it's been in that phase two for uh, with Alzheimer's disease patients. It's also been tested for type two diabetes where it was uh, tested in parallel with pioglitazone, the TCD I was talking about earlier, where they saw that it was as effective at the higher doses given as pioglitazone in uh, uh, the aspect of treating type 2 diabetes, but it had less of the negative side effects that pioglitazone has. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. And on that, um, we'll wrap up today's session. So thanks to our two speakers. We have a few unanswered questions that I'll post in the 3P discussion uh, Facebook page. So if you want to continue the discussion there, please go to that or look at our Twitter account to see the link for that Facebook group. Um, so again, thank you for today's speakers. It was super interesting listening about the therapies for synuclonopathies. Uh, next Tuesday, we have another session at 12 p.m. So if you'd like to listen in about the analysis of heterozygous PRKN variants and genome-wide pathology uh, pathway-specific polygenic risk in Parkinson's disease, if the topics that interest you, then please register and sign in next Tuesday for that session. And hopefully people have also seen the polling feature is now closed. So we will let you know about the career advice session that we'll be having next Thursday as well. So with that, again, thanks to our speakers and thank you all for attending today's session. And we'll you. see you next week. Bye. Bye.